This week, we're up, up and away. Taking apart the first order, hollow grandpa and confetti cannon. This week, 108,000 people landed in Barcelona with one thing on their minds, mobiles. Welcome to the Mobile World Congress, the enormous annual expo where we get to hear about the latest in phones, tablets and, increasingly, anything that moves. Smartwatch with built-in projector, anyone? Now, the mobile industry is increasingly important to the world's economy. Last year, it was worth $3.6 trillion. Five billion of us have mobiles, 3.3 billion use the mobile internet. And despite it being the coldest MWC that we can remember, the halls were still packed with thousands of exhibitors showing off their wares. This one definitely looks weatherproof. And roaming the show floor for us this year, Lara Lewington. Well, despite talk of how many of the big players aren't releasing new phones at the show, there are quite a few new phones on display. And the cameras were often taking centre stage. This is both the mode. We saw how we might interact with our devices in the future. Who needs buttons when you can gesture? It works. And the way they might interact with us. A phone screen that bends? Could a bendy phone be the future? But to really get to grips with the latest news here, I joined forces with a man who seriously knows his phones. HMD, who bought Nokia's phone brand a few years back, are again embracing the nostalgia factor with a 2018 twist with its 8110 4G. And no, you don't have to have it in banana yellow. Would you feel silly to take that out of your pocket? Absolutely in that colour. I would need it to be black or any other colour except bright yellow. Its operating system can only run a few apps. However, they will include Google Assistant, Google Maps and Facebook, although not Twitter or WhatsApp. But with battery life of up to 25 days, well, that's on standby, and a price tag of just 70 quid, it sounds a decent proposition. It is. With 4G2, that's all of the data connectivity that you'd want, a ridiculously low price. How nice is it to hold it like that, frame the shot, and then use the centre button to take it? Meanwhile, one manufacturer managed to create a whole exclusive world of their own. Hi there. I feel underdressed. Sorry, not you. You should have a special blue card to enter this hall. Thank you. I'm not just underdressed, I'm not allowed in even though they weren't releasing a new phone. But the biggest announcement, of course, came from Samsung with news of the release of their S9. And Spencer's got his hands on one of the devices. Yeah, although even here, at the big reveal of a phone, it was the camera that was very much front and centre. For a start, the Samsung Galaxy S9 and S9 Plus shoot better pictures in low light, reducing grain by taking a burst of 12 shots at once. The larger S9 Plus actually has two lenses, which work together to produce photos with a blurred background, in the same way that the iPhone 7 Plus has done since 2016. This, though, is quite new here in the West. It's the first phone I've seen that has a mechanical aperture, which can switch from f2.4 to f1.5 to let in more light. Now, last year we saw a Sony phone which could shoot at 40 times slow-mo. That's 960 frames per second. And as we predicted then, that feature is now starting to migrate into other phones. One problem I had with Sony's super slow-mo mode is that you had to be incredibly precise in order to start the recording and capture those 0.2 seconds of slow-mo action. Not so with the S9, it waits until it detects motion in a certain part of the viewfinder and then it fires the slow-mo mode. So... 
that should mean that you don't miss those milliseconds of slow-mo magic. Now, the video is of the lower 720p resolution, but that's still acceptable on a phone screen, and the results can be shared as GIFs or used as wallpapers on your lock screen. Anyone got a tell? Hot on the heels of Apple's iPhone Animojis, the S9 lets you create and send your own emojis. Now, these do look a bit like you, but quite impressively, they'll copy your expression using live face tracking. Or you can use one of the presets that are created from your <coughs> likeness. Overall, the S9 and S9 Plus look and feel just like their predecessors. The same size, they're dust and water resistant, and they still have the headphone socket. Hurrah! But the screen is ever so slightly longer. They'll now take SD cards of up to 400 gigabytes, and they can play Dolby Atmos sound. And where the S8 could be plugged into a special dock to connect to a screen, mouse and keyboard, the S9 can actually become a trackpad, and soon this will also double as a keyboard. Even with the S9's better tech specs, critics have said that the improvements over the S8 are massive, but I do think that the camera and the sharing functions are sure to be eye-catchers. And of course, no super slow-mo shoot is complete without lots and lots of confetti. Well, only the day after Samsung announced their phone and their slow-mo camera, we found out that Sony have upgraded theirs to 960 frames per second and it's in full HD, which makes it better. So, Andy, what do you think of this situation? You had a go with the Sony camera earlier. I did, and it really is better than Samsung's effort. Sony's had experience. This is the second time they've done this, and full HD, when you see it, it's glorious glorious in comparison to the 720 noisy bit pixely on the Galaxy S9. By far better. So is this really going to sell phones? No, it's not. It's a cool feature and you'll use it once and if you get it right, it's brilliant. But for the 10 times you get it wrong, you're going to get frustrated and not use it. The phone is also optimised for Sony's entertainment suite, a feature they're going big on. The phone features what they call dynamic vibration, so whether you're streaming from Amazon, Netflix or YouTube, or playing a game, similar to a PlayStation controller, it uses the audio path to provide haptic feedback. It's just holding it for two hours like that, that would be quite excessive. Aside from the phones themselves, there was a lot of chat about 5G's commercial rollout. Amongst it, T-Mobile announcing plans to launch it in at least four US cities by the end of the year. A commercial service is also expected to kick off in South Korea, proving 5G wasn't just for the Winter Olympics. They may not have wanted me on the show floor, but a Huawei did invite me to go for a spin, if you can call it that. A Huawei have come up with a novel way of testing a phone. They've connected it to this vehicle and the phone is actually going to drive the car. This being an attempt to show off the processing power and image recognition of their Mate 10 Pro, which was released last year, rather than something they actually plan on executing in the real world. Not that they trusted the inbuilt camera for this job. They've attached a large external one. The phone uses artificial intelligence to process what it sees. I'm told it recognises around a thousand objects. In turn, it'll send signals to the vehicle via Wi-Fi, which will then control the car through a robotic system. The technology that we're using to power this actually exists within the phone already. So the artificial intelligence, which sits at the heart of what we're showing here, is part of the everyday experience of your smartphone. There we go, I'm in gear. In a way, this feels quite strange at the moment. There's just people moving around things and that's a really big ball. How often do you see a ball that size in the road? 
Now the phone has had a chance to learn, it's time for round two, where it should instruct the vehicle to react to any hazards it identifies. Here goes. This feels slightly nerve-wracking. And they're saving the dog. OK, so just for a bit of fun, if we detect a bicycle, I'm going to swerve right in. Ah, the giant ball I'm going to break. Just to warn you, this will take off a little bit quicker. It's not going to be that dramatic, is it? It's not a racetrack we're on. <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm holding on tight. Oh, that's quite weird. So that was chosen at random. So the, the phone recognised the object that was put out. Yeah. It then said, OK, what did you want to do in the event that I saw that? So it saw the object and then it commanded the, the manoeuvre that you, you said. So you and said, it avoided so it, right. And it avoided and it brought us to a stop. Oh well, I guess it did what they promised. And for them, well, it got us talking about a phone that isn't even new. Hello and welcome to the Week in Tech. It was the week that drones replaced models on the catwalk in Milan, carrying the latest Dolce and Gabbana handbags. OneWeb and Airbus announced a network of 900 satellites to provide next-gen 5G mobile internet to plane travellers by 2020, while Vodafone and Nokia plan to go one further and deliver mobile internet to the moon, albeit using 4G. The network would provide a way for lunar rovers to stream data from as early as next year. Snake robots have slithered out from the labs of Harvard University. The robots move using laser-cut scales, which expand and contract to propel them. Researchers are perfecting this way of moving to help tackle difficult terrain and to be used in intestinal surgery. It was also the week that Amazon bought Ring, the smart doorbell company. This adds to their growing collection of smart home products and paves the way for deliveries not only to your door, but even inside your home, which may ring alarm bells for those concerned with privacy. And finally, California has joined Arizona and removed the need for driverless cars to have a human behind the wheel. Companies would still need to maintain the ability to control the car remotely and a plan for how the cops could pull the car over to speak to the car. This is possibly one of the more surprising things on the show floor. I'm currently in a holoportal. portal. The setup consists of four Kinect sensors, five laptops that are doing the grunt work, and once a person has been created in holographic form, well, they can be seen on this, the Microsoft HoloLens, in real time. And I've been to see a family who are really putting this setup to good use. So Harrison's got something called Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a fatal genetic muscle wasting disease. It means that every single muscle cell in his body is deteriorating over time. Um, unfortunately, that means that he loses the ability and the strength to do a lot of things that we all take for granted. Uh, simply walking, giving your parents a hug, things like that, they just, they, they go in time. And he has a life expectancy somewhere between um, 20 and 25, which is when the heart and the lungs, which are also, also muscles, um, give up and then we, we lose them then. Since Harrison came off his feet at the end of last year, being able to create stimulating and engaging experiences at home has become more important than ever. And today he has a virtual visitor. This research prototype is currently being perfected at Double Me's Ravensbourne College base. Harrison, how are you? OK. I see the hollow, Grandpa. Are you in charge of cooking tonight? Yep. Your dad would like a steak that's that big. Uh, he's allowed one that's this big. We've got next Tuesday, pancake day. What are you going to have on your pancakes this year? Definitely maple syrup. Along with this mixed reality setup are AR and VR versions. Eventually, maybe more than one person being holoported at a time, or two-way video and audio could be possible. But right now, it's about getting the basics right. 
Although what is created here isn't a true hologram, the headset displays Hollow Grandpa as a three-dimensional projection, as if he was in the room. There was, when we tested it, a bit of a time lag due to a lack of processing power and connection. And it was all done in the spirit of kind of inspired by Star Wars, but using the tech as we can do it now. So we knew it wouldn't be the most amazing fidelity, but it was always the magic of how would Harrison feel in his home when Grandpa holoports in and says hello, you know. So that thing, the tagline for Harrison's charity is make time. And as we know, time is precious. So, um, the, you know, this transcendence of space and time through technology to be together is potentially very powerful. Arsenal beat Tottenham. Never in a million years is that going to happen. 3-1 to Tottenham, Harry Kane scores two. Yeah! Yeah! Mm. One of the themes this year is what mobile connectivity can do to transform lives. The company Case for Change is documenting projects around the world, hoping to inspire others. Whether it's empowering women in India or giving farmers in Mexico resources to help grow crops, most of the projects could be replicated on a larger scale, something the World Bank believes could be possible very soon. We're seeing tremendous amounts of uh, access to the internet. In Africa, for example, the number of smartphones will go from about 220 million in 2015 to over 700 million in 2020 in just five short years. So our assumption is that very soon, Everyone will have access to broadband and everyone will have access to smartphones. But what we know is that unless the industry, working with groups like ours, thinks specifically about how to take these applications and make them work at scale in developing countries, it won't happen. Whilst getting connected for many may be the start, this drone for deployment during large-scale disasters is part of Nokia's Saving Lives project. As well as providing views that wouldn't be possible from the ground, the full kit creates a network bubble of up to a four kilometre radius when connection would otherwise be unavailable. Real-time video streaming, gas and heat sensing, mapping and analytics could help rescuers respond better and more safely. It'll be sent for its first real-world exercise in the Philippines with the Red Cross this summer. This display illustrates a smart farm setup that went live in Turkey last month. The idea is that sensors are placed throughout the farm and they sync up to an app providing information like how healthy the crops are, the condition of the soil and humidity, so that a farmer can be alerted if there's a problem. That information can then be provided to the farmer through the low power network it's connected to. So if there's a fungal disease, for example, it can immediately be identified and dealt with. It's all very well collecting a lot of data, but what we actually do with that data is really important. Every year in India alone, 2.8 million people are diagnosed with tuberculosis. And this map aims to use predictive modelling to find out the areas that are most at risk. So the red parts that you can see here are where the disease is already prevalent. It's possible to add an extra layer to that data by tapping on here and we can see mobile phone usage, which of course represents where the people are. By identifying these areas of the highest risk, it means that awareness can be raised, clinics can be ready, expecting there to be more cases of TB, and of course, immunisations can be given to hopefully prevent some of those cases from even happening. And that's it from MWC this year. After all that, it's time to take a relaxing trip elsewhere. Oh, the wind's blowing through my hair. Oh, amazing. We'll sit down and relax. Stunning. That was Lara in Barcelona. Now, after weeks of build-up, the Oscars are finally here. The 90th Academy Awards are this weekend. And over the past few weeks, we've been going exclusively behind the scenes with some of the nominees in the Best Visual Effects category. This week, it's the fourth in our series, which is the ninth in their series, otherwise known as Episode 8. 
Yes, of course I'm talking about Star Wars, The Last Jedi. Let the past die. Kill it. We aim to try and do as much as we can in camera. The reality is there are always going to be shots, sequences or big moments that are going to need visual effects. And on a film like this, it's a Star Wars movie. We, we ultimately ended up with over 2,000 uh, effect shots in the film. You have too much of your father's heart in you. It took almost a year to get to the final look of Snoke. And it's, it's an organic process. Uh, we start with a maquette. We copied that, we scanned it, we digitized it, brought it in started to paint textures, started to build the internal controls and anatomy of that character. And then as uh, the editors, Ryan and uh, Bob, were working together, they brought together the sequences only using Andy's reference. And he had this incredible, powerful performance, a very resonant voice. Closer, I said. <laughs> Young fool, it was I who bridged your minds. The amazing thing about Andy is he's incredibly skilled at doing this and he's unafraid of the technology. So we were able to suit him up in, a, in an active motion capture suit so that we could actually film with infrared cameras uh, from the ceiling of the set. That allowed him to walk around and perform unhindered. We also put a, a, a helmet on his head with four HD cameras so we could get very clear definition on his face. And then as we started to do animation tests and early dailies on the material, we got a few weeks into it and Ryan actually came to me and said, I'm not sure that the voice is actually matching the anatomy of the, the character that we've designed. And we realized there was an issue there. The, the initial design made it look like a very fragile, frail, older character and Andy's voice is this booming, resonant, wonderful thing. So we actually had to open up the chest, we had to take some of the uh, scoliotic distortion out of his spine and we actually made him another foot and a half taller. So he's, he's about eight, eight and a half foot, uh, the final character. As soon as we did it, we knew we'd, we'd hit the right combination and we could move forward. The bombing run was in the original script almost exactly as you see it in the film. We did bid uh, how to execute the bombing run as a piece of miniature photography with motion control and bring all the layers in and composite them, practical pyrotechnics and everything. And the, the schedule and cost of that was just too prohibitive. But the important thing for me is, when working with a director like Ryan is, is to communicate that we can make uh, our CG look like any particular style of thing at the moment. We, we can make it look like a balsa wood model, a very shiny, modern, uh, sort of CG looking ship. We have that control over the, the way that we can render things now. And after a time, Ryan became confident in what we could do and actually it was a liberation. Uh, we could achieve anything and the explosions and pyrotechnics uh, that we've achieved in the bombing run, I think uh, uh, have pushed us to a new level of believability. Uh, we, we've gone right into the ships and we model Rather than modeling the outside first, we actually model from the inside out. So all, uh, as you destroy a ship, you're actually opening up holes and the viewer can see in, the audience can see in. It, it was really exciting to do. And uh, I think it took the, the destruction to a new level. I, I think our contributions to films are getting more and more invisible in certain cases, but when they're not invisible because you know they can't be real, they're getting more believable. Globally, the visual effects techniques are so advanced now that it's now important to tell a good story. And it's now important that that story has good ideas and creative challenges that push us to create visuals that have never been seen before. And we wish the entire crew of The Last Jedi, along with all of the other nominees, the very best of luck for this weekend's Oscars, because they're all fantastic. That's it for this week. Don't forget that we live on Twitter. You can find us there at BBC Click and on Facebook all throughout this and every week. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you soon.